right. Well, I think we will go ahead and get started. So we have plenty of time. Uh, my name is Karen Smith Fernandez. I'm the director of major gifts here at NatureServe. I've been uh, only with NatureServe for the last couple of years, and it has been an exciting and rewarding uh, experience already. So I can't wait to hear from everyone else on this call about your many years associated with this fabulous network and organization. And I'm going to kick it off right away over to Rob Solomon with a big thanks to Rob, to Rick, to Sabra, and to Bryce for coming together to reach out to alumni and to get um, some connectivity going once again. So Rob, thank you so much Great. and take it from here. Thank you very much. Okay, and um, so again, this is Rob Solomon, formerly of the Nature Conservancy and formerly of ABI and NatureServe. Uh, so uh, I know many of you on there and I'm sure many of you know me. And uh, so, you know, we thought in talking with Rick and Sabre, we really felt that this would be a good way to see what we could do with an alumni group to get things started. This is kind of an exploratory webinar. I will say that in the very beginning. Um, uh, for my part, it will be light on detailed information, um, more discussion and kind of a, a feeling of how we progress as an organization. Of course, Bryce will be presenting some information that is true, detailed information that um, I think you'll find very interesting, uh, particularly as alumni. Uh, but part of this is really to kind of get a sense of what alumni are doing, what we're up to, and how we might want to function as an alumni group. I, I don't think there's been any uh, effort of this type before where folks have gotten together either in a presentation or around a table. I know there were discussions at times about having alumni, you know, attend conferences as a group and having sessions for them. But I don't know that any of that's happened yet. At least I haven't heard about it. So this, you know, is a way to kind of find out if that's something that's of interest to alumni and go from there. And towards the end of this, We'll be talking, um, as as Karen said, she's going to open it up so everybody can kind of talk and be seen. And we'll be interested to hear, you know, what you've been up to, um, how that may relate to any work you're doing with the network or in the conservation community. You know, if you're supporting the network in one way or the other in nature serve and, you know, what you think the alumni group should mean to you. So hopefully we'll get some good ideas. And what we don't get to at the end of this, because I'm doing a bit of talking here and you know what can happen when I start doing a bit of talk. So if we run out of time and don't get to cover all the topics we want to cover, there'll be opportunities through some surveys that are going to be going out again afterwards where we can get more input from you. So just want to mention that. Okay, um, so I'm going to get started with the actual presentation part. And as you know, this is the Link to a Legacy alumni. Uh, webinar. And this is the session agenda we came up with. As I said, it's somewhat informal and loose, except for Bryce's part, which will be, you know, pretty informative. Um, but, you know, for my part, I really wanted to talk a little bit about some of the outstanding achievements that the organization has, the network, Nature Service Network, has really accomplished in the last several years. And it's from a perspective of really what they've meant to me in representing the just amazing value and efficiency and effectiveness of this collaborative effort that's been going on for 50 years. I mean, after 50 years, it's more relevant than it's ever been. And, you know, I'm in contact with folks from NatureServe on a fairly regular basis. I get details on some of the things that are, you know, being done. And it, it just amazes me to, to hear that we keep moving forward, it keeps advancing as an as an organization and overcoming some longstanding obstacles that you know I can look back to my early years at the organization and see these things that have been obstacles for a long time finally being overcome. So that's kind of what my focus is in presenting some of these outstanding achievements. And I think you'll you'll see what I mean as I go through it. So Okay, here we go. So the first part is just to very briefly, I'm going to just, you know, again, uh, have Rick and Sabra and Bryce introduce themselves a little bit, say a few things about each other. Um, Bryce, I, I put this middle uh, photograph in there for you. Um, I'm hoping you recognize the folks in there. 
I don't know if you Absolutely. do. Absolutely. Um, okay. Uh, for those of you who don't, that's I think it was the original cast of the Montana Heritage Program. Um, that's Dave Jenner, Lisa Shepard, Andy Kratz, and Steve Shelley um, at a conference. I think it was around 1984, that conference. Um, and I'll let the rest of you kind of figure out who some of the other people in the pictures are. There's one interesting shot of a very early important person in the organization. Well, it was it was her early days in the organization, um, and she became very important. Not that everybody in the organization isn't important, because <laughs> they are. Um, anyway, so I'll just again say Rob Solomon um, started with uh, the organization at the Nature Conservancy. I was actually hired originally as uh, the data manager for the Model Heritage Program. And for you, those of you who don't know, the Model Heritage Program was a concept that Bob had developed early on where it was supposed to be a test bed for new methodology and new technologies. And it was a full complement of staff. Um, it was me, uh, uh, Mary Palmer was the botanist, Dave Wilkove was the uh, zoologist. Um, and uh, that was basically the how it was constituted. And uh, it was, you know, it was a... 1986 when I started. And um, I was also hired to, to be involved in some software development because I had computer programming background uh, to help develop it, uh, refine it, distribute it to member programs because it was the first iteration of our of the network software that was actually desktop based and support it. And the development, uh, distribution and support of heritage systems is pretty much where I stayed for the rest of my career um, throughout NatureServe. I will say though that I think the reason I got hired was because Bob put his thumb on the scale a little bit because he heard I had some actual GIS experience and he really wanted to get spatial mapping into the system. Um, so I, I kind of got pulled in for that reason. Although it wasn't long after that, we got some other really talented GIS people like Frank Biasi, who I think is on the call, right? Um, anyway, so Rick, you want to say a couple of second words? Yeah, I'm Rick Snyder. Um, I got my start in the network uh, as a contract uh, field inventory person for the North Carolina Natural Heritage Program, and then spent most of my career as a director of the Nebraska Natural Heritage Program. I retired in 2019 and then uh, ended up in Virginia and worked for NatureServe for about a year and a half, mostly uh, working with helping with the rollout of the environmental review tool. So that's my quick history. Dave? Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. The, this is Sabra. Um, I worked for the Arizona Natural Heritage Program for about 31 years. Uh, started as an intern there when it first came to uh, the Game and Fish Department. And during my 31 plus years, I served on the U.S. Section Council and also was on the Board of Directors for a number of years. And just retired uh, a year ago. Right. And I'm Bryce Maxwell. I'm the program coordinator at the Montana Natural Heritage Program, and uh, I served on the NatureServe board and served on the U.S. Section Council for a bit. Okay, Karen, do you want to say a quick hello again, just to explain your involvement? Sure. I'm sorry, my video doesn't seem to be working at the moment, but I'm Karen Smith Fernandez, and I'm the director of Major Gifts here at NatureServe, and I've been here a couple of years on our newly established philanthropy team of three. Great. Thank you. Um, and I did forget, I wanted to just say one favorite thing about my 31 years in the organization. Um, I realized it was a collection of things, and I really feel that it was the 41 plus heritage programs and CDCs that I actually got to visit in person. It was really the best part of it over all those years for me. I don't know if you want to add something, Rick? Nope. Well, we're, you're burning up time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we'll move on. All right. So here's where I'm just going to talk about a few of the outstanding achievement. Again, it's from my perspective and, you know, what I see is really representing, you know, advancements and just overcoming obstacles. So 
Uh, I'm going to get started by taking us back a little bit. The, um, you know, I, I looked at the vision and the mission that we currently have for NatureServe. And one thing that really just stuck out at me is how it has really not changed much since the very early days. Um, I've come into possession of some archival material and in going through it, I found some really old documents, including one, which was Bob's kind of description of the uh, the heritage, the Natural Heritage Trust back in 1977. And while this isn't exactly a mission statement, it's basically saying the same thing. You know, we're going to we're going to gather information. We're going to organize it. We're going to use it to establish, identify priorities, protection, and we're going to use it to plan and implement protection. So it's 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 basically the same mission after 50 years and we're following it same thing with the process the data this is a diagram from an old you know presentation bob did back in the early 80s and it's largely the same flow diagram as what we see now in in our data to, to decision life cycle it hasn't really changed that much and Again, as I as I as I talk about some of the accomplishments, I keep thinking back to the whole notion of the data pipeline and how you know how so much of the uh, effort and so many of the obstacles we face were getting through that pipeline. It was a long pipeline early on. There was data going into it, and it took so much effort to get it out the other end. Plus, there were always issues about it getting stuck because there were things we had to do, whether it was data exchange or whether it was just validating data and getting it from the right source going out in the field. So in many ways, kind of the eternal issue um, for this whole process to me was the whole ping in a python. Uh, it really was so hard to get all this information out and to kind of just show again how things have changed. I'm going to take you back a little bit further to, uh, you know, to where we were. But first, when I started looking at the accomplishments, there were just so many just within the last four years since I've, I've left the organization. And I started to put together a list and it just got so detailed that I realized I couldn't really present it in this manner to you. So I do have this information available and anybody who's interested in it will send this out to you. You can just see my real top list with some descriptions you know, what their benefits were in moving the organization forward and in conservate towards conservation in general. And I also, you know, because it's a focus of mine from the very beginning is, is, is how the network has been so essential and crucial to making these things happen. And so anybody who wants this can see it. Uh, my focus is going to be on just a few things like the expansion of our data models, some, the new ecology strategy, uh, improvements in the data exchange process, the climate change vulnerability index, and then about data delivery. So to get started, again, I'm taking you back a little bit. This is where it was when I started. It was moving a lot of paper around. It was a major effort. Um, and everybody, I think, who's on this call, or most of you on your call, have seen this at one time or another in one of the offices you were in. It was just a massive amount of effort to get documentation, to write information down, transcribe it, get computers and it was just it slowed the whole process down but it was what we had to work with the technologies were much better to begin with when i started who's basically programs who wanted to enter data or access a base had to use a telephone couple like the one in the picture below it and you know if they wanted a report they literally would have to submit the report online over over the phone and then wait for the Arlington office to mail back the printouts to them that were printed out in the Arlington office. So not a very efficient way. Uh, you know, we shortly after I started or around the time I started, we were getting into desktop computers, which definitely improved it. And, and I think have seen the whole history of the, the different te technologies, BCD being one that came and improved it a little bit, but still desktop and and still fairly slow and a lot of issues, even things like whenever systems got updated, there was a whole process for getting those updates distributed and installed in new programs. Other things in the beginning, you know, we had a very simple data model to start. This is the lowest common denominator file structure. That was the concept that had been first developed by Bob. Very basic element occurrences, element abstracts, managed areas, and some auxiliary, auxiliary files. 
Um, the picture on the pictures of paper on the right side here are actually handwritten notes by Bob Dinkins back in the very early 80s, late 70s, of the basic data model. This is from a flip chart I found in the archival documents I had and just thought it would be worth sharing. So it was a pretty basic data model. And that's changed, obviously. Now systems make the data available almost instantaneously online. Um, and we're not limited to what we can do on a desktop. Certainly don't have to wait for, even though it's interestingly, the data is now again, centrally organized. It's still at the desktop instantaneously of every individual program. And it's even available out in the field now um, you know, and as Bryce will talk a little bit about the observation data and how that's being collected, you'll see more details about how amazing that is in terms of us being able to get data that fills in gaps that we've had for many years. The thing is, too, as, as the uh, technologies have improved, the fact that the data models we're dealing with got more and more complex have been less of an issue. So we're kind of, you know, slimming down that pig in a python a little bit, despite the fact that there's more data going in. Okay. And so, you know, one of the first things that I listed as, you know, a major step from my perspective has been the incorporation of a, of a biodiversity observation data standard. I mean, this, I can't even remember how far back this was first discussed. I can remember one meeting, uh, actually, a, a bunch of us had at the New York Heritage Program, Bob Jenkins came to that meeting too, where we talked about, you know, beginning to collect observation data. I think it was around the time when the whole sub-EO and, and um, source feature topics were coming up because of biotics coming into being. And Bob was very cynical about the idea of us collecting observation data. I mean, I think he felt that was going to be a distraction. We'd be adding more and more data and not getting out. But again, this was at a time where he could not have imagined how feasible it was to store and manage that kind of data and how instantaneously that data could be accessed and put into a database. There, you know, we're even working more. They're working more on how to facilitate that flow from the field, from various sources into databases and out to the users. Um, so it's just amazing that as these databases have become even more complex, the technology is supporting it. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next thing, you know, which was on my list, which is really the incorporation of data models, um, species distribution data models into, into our um, suite of, of data managed by the network. And the MOBI project, the map of biodiversity importance is a very significant step in that. But the fact is, this has been in the works for many, many years. Um, a lot of this st stemmed from, I think it was a, a series of workshops that Gary Beauvais of the Wyoming Heritage Program initiated back in early 2000s. Um, and those went on and it, it really, you know, it kept going. But I think it was the, the MOBI project that really help push this forward in establishing standards for the use of these kinds of models and um, you know, getting them refined and reviewed. Also, the MOBI project is just a, an amazing example of network collaboration. It just really, I was, I was just uh, my last year when the MOBI project got started. And so I still had some involvement in terms of just giving some of the network folks who were gonna be involved in it access to the um, ArcGIS online tools that they were going to be using. And it was just wonderful to see, you know, with a click of a button, people were getting access and were starting to put in data and review data. And it just, you know, got better and better. And it's an amazing, an amazing thing. Um, I mean, I think most of you probably know a bit about the MOBI project, but, you know, for me, it's also represents one of the big obstacles or issues that we dealt with was the the underrepresentation and overrepresentation issue, where elements occurrence is just underrepresented the distribution of species and range maps over could overrepresent it. And then now, you know, with with the models being used and the environmental predictor library that could be used to help, you know, along with machine learning to develop these models and get them revised, reviewed, and revised again, 
by expertise out in the field, heritage programs, you know, real habitat prediction models were developed, which could be used for a variety of different purposes. So, um, and the models now are being shared. They're not just used and that's it, but um, Nature Serve Explorer Pro, which is a tool, you know, uh, that's used to distribute data now and uh, is used quite widely uh, across the network is a, is a repository for a lot of these models and folks can download them and see their practical use, where they apply and where they don't apply and start to use them locally. So, uh, you know, and it's, it's, it's overall impact on conservation has been pretty significant already. Uh, this was information I got from Reagan Smith, uh, used by TNC, Defenders of Wildlife, local land trusts for con and conservation organizations to communicate the importance of the work they do. The U.S. climate risk application has been incorporating it um, and used by several of these federal agencies. And then, of course, it got us on the front page of the national section of the New York Times, which is not a bad thing at all for the NatureServe network to be on that page of the New York Times and so widely known. And on a personal note, uh, it's not exactly the same thing, but it resonated with me because one of the first projects I worked on was the EMAP project back in the early 90s, with was Larry Masters project. And it was a similar type of effort without the modeling, of course, a very crude modeling, I would say, where we were trying to gather, you know, distribution information on species for a number of states. But, you know, it was a two-year project. We only were able to do eight states. And the tool we used, which was a PCR info tool, was pretty crude. So when I see the magnitude of the effort and the success of the Moby project, it meant a lot to me because I remember the some of the pain associated with doing this EMAP project early on. Uh, I'm moving on to the next thing that was a kind of a, a really popped out at me, and that's the decision um, within the last year uh, for the new nature survey ecology strategy to finalize on the national vegetation classification as the primary system for many applications. Um, and I know they're doing more work where it's going to be coming out with a new version in 2024. But to, to give you a sense of why this really resonates from, for me, uh, I have a little bit of a story, which is, is takes me back to my early days. So uh, this is me literally a few months after I started at, at the Nature Conservancy as data manager. And I remember one day just sitting in my office, which was directly across from the science department's main conference room. And a bunch of these guys came in. I had never seen them before. Again, I hadn't been there that long. Uh, they filed into the conference room, followed shortly thereafter by Bob Jenkins. And after a couple of minutes, it seemed to me that there was there some very strange noises coming out of the conference rooms. And then those noises turned into screen, you know, to shouts and table pounding and just sounded very chaotic, very angry, very explosive. And after a while, it almost seemed like the walls of the conference room were bulging out and the doors were going to explode off the hinge. I didn't know what was going on. And shortly after that, uh, Chip, Robert Chipley, who was the head of heritage field operations at the time, he walked in and, and I, you know, basically asked him, is, you know, what's going on? Is everything all right in there? And he had a very simple answer for me. Oh, yeah, it's just Bob meeting with the ecologists. So I watched that room to make sure it wasn't about to explode for quite a while. And after a couple of hours, the door opened. The ecologist filtered out. I think it was Tom Ruinsky from the Eastern region, Patrick Bougeron from Rocky Mountain, um, uh, uh, Kim Chapman from the Midwest region. And then they looked pretty bedraggled as they came out. Shortly after that, Bob emerged and he looked like he was ready to explode. And it was my first lesson. And my first lesson working for the Nature Conservancy really was never make eye contact with Bob when the ecologists are in town. And it was a good lesson because, you know, it was, there was a lot of, you know, arguments and disputes about what classification system to use early on. Oop, excuse me, I didn't need to go there. And so the fact that there is now one that's been settled on 
at least for now, and they're continuing to do it. And there's crosswalking being done by state programs, which is going to allow for you know better coordination across borders. It's just, it just to me, it's a major step moving forward. Okay. Then the next thing that really popped out to me, and this is something that I felt the pain and suffering from directly myself, was the whole data exchange effort. For many years when I was there, I would say that that was kind of the biggest point of contention often between the central office and the individual programs, because it was so much work for everybody to do. The preparation, getting it done, meant a lot of staff time directed to just doing that. I know programs often swapped staff to help each other get things done back then. Nature Serve or the TNC at the time sent people sometimes out to programs to help out. It was just a major effort. And now we're on the verge of having ongoing spontaneous data exchange um, available to programs. This is an example of the data exchange alert workbench where every day, every day pretty much, or any day, uh, a program can open this up and see what has been pushed down from the central database to theirs, what changes have been made, and they can act on it instantaneously if they want or whenever they can get to it, but it's right there. They don't have to wait and do it once a year. It's ongoing. And it, within a matter, within the next year or so, the other direction will be available where data from the heritage programs will automatically just go up to central when it's ready. So this is a major step in terms of efficiency and the, the way staff time can really spend its, its efforts in what they have to focus on. Okay, uh, I'm almost to the end here. Uh, the uh, other point that I had listed here was, of course, the Climate Change Vulnerability Index, which kind of speaks for itself as to why it's such a major advance um, and why it's continued to make this organization a relevant organization over the years. And is also a good example of, of a, a major collaboration between the network programs and NatureServe. Uh, I talked with Bruce Young about it a little bit, and you know, he pointed out that, you know, the this the whole first off, the the, the seed funding for the this investigation was provided by the Nevada and Pennsylvania program. And then scientists from across the network were very involved in validating and helping to refine it. And there were two, two co-authors on the paper that describes the, mod, the uh, vulnerability index are heritage scientists. So it's just a really great example. And it's a great example of advancements and continued relevancy to me. Um, and the fact that a lot of states are beginning to incorporate this into their updates of their, of their 2015 um, state wildlife action plans is another indication that not only is it relevant, it's getting used. And so the last little section of, of items that I want to cover have to do with the way data now gets distributed, because that was also, in the beginning, always a difficult thing. How do you communicate this information? I mean, there were data requests that went out on a regular basis from individual programs, but there was really only, in the very early days, one main channel for the data that was collected to influence some of the more major conservation decision. And I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Now we do have it available at your fingertip pretty much instantaneously, whether it's the individual state environmental review tools, which can provide you know, review processes you know, spontaneously, conservation planning options, um, or even just you know, data access options, or the Nature Serve Explorer and Nature Serve Explorer Pro, which also allow for in, in spontaneous, instantaneous access to the network's complement of data with the appropriate restrictions on you know, who has a license to see what. It also ensures that anything that is accessed at a central level is appropriately pointing back to its local source. So that nature serve isn't providing data on the behalf of Nebraska or Arizona, but they're providing general data. And when more specific data and relevant data is required, it points folks back to that program. Um, this is just an example of, of some of the tools. I, I included Sabres because she's here. But you know, the main thing here was the fact that it was able to automate and streamline the environmental review process so effectively. Uh, where project submissions can be reviewed by multiple agencies when when uh, when needed. And to me, the reason this is so important is because 
it effectively is has a daily, if not hourly impact on conservation decisions that are made, which is just amazing. I mean, every time somebody submits a project, it's in uh, uh, that that could be affected by it or, or could affect you know imperiled species. This is capturing it. This is intercepting it, and this is reporting it. So it it is. It's really a spontaneous uh, value or an instantaneous value that in the past could take so long. And you know, Nature Serve sort of Explore or Nature Serve sort of Pro and Nature Serve sort of Explore Pro rather. Um, are doing the same thing at a multi-jurisdictional le level. And again, to take you back and give you the comparison, when I started, there really was a single way that this really got out, the data got out. And that was through the annual state scorecard session where once a year, um, heritage programs and their state TNC field office would get together. And there was a lot of time that went into preparing for these meetings and the meetings themselves were fairly long. And they would basically go through huge printouts of you know species on different sites, and they would make the decision about what their site preservation protection uh, efforts were going to be that particular year. Um, I mean, at the same time, individual state programs were responding to individual local data requests, and it was very onerous. One of the things I found in the archival material that I had mentioned I have access to right now was an old report that was done, I think it was in 1987. It was a scientific study that um, that uh, Boren, the president of the Nature Conservancy, commissioned to review at that time the science department and the heritage operations to see if they were effectively doing what they were supposed to be doing. Um, it's a very interesting report actually to read now, but one of the things is they asked the heritage programs to fill out a lot of questions on things. And one of the questions was, how much time does your staff spend on data requests? And what was interesting is the predominant answer was like between 15 to 25 percent of staff time is doing local data requests. Although there were a good number of programs who were in the 30 to 50 percent category. And Florida said they were in the 50 to 70 percent category of staff time spent on data requests. So with tools like ERT and Nature Serve sort of Explorer and Explorer Pro, this is a significant thing that staff do not have to spend their time just on data requests. They can actually be building the database and improving the quality of the data. So it's pretty amazing. Presentation on things and accomplishments but are we there yet in terms of instant gratification? Not quite, but we're certainly getting closer. So again, hopefully uh, you found it entertaining to hear my thoughts on what these were. Uh, and there's lots of sources of information on the details of this. And in fact, we'll be sharing some documentation um, with you that includes links to where you can get um, access to some webinars, some great webinars that go into way more detail on some of these individual products and activities. And uh, there's just lots of sources for this. And so I hope you'll find uh, a way to take advantage of some of that. And with that, I am going, oh, and this is an example of some of the um, information that we'll provide you. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Bryce and let him talk about something that you might find, you know, directly of interest to you because of potential participation. So, Bryce. Thanks, Rob. Uh, well, one of the slides that you had shown that uh, of Bob Jenkins that he couldn't have envisioned was uh, all the citizen science possibilities that exist today. And yeah. the fact that we have the the potential for every citizen out there to be walking around as a sensor for gathering data. Um, and so I'd like to tell you our story in Montana on the iNaturalist front today. Next slide. Sure. Okay, um, just whenever you want me to advance, just say so. Yep. Um, and so our data uh, centralization philosophy in Montana for all of our partners has long been that there's no one right way. Just get us the data. We'll solve it. We'll figure out how to get it into the system. 
And um, so we, um, you know, we'll take it in Excel. We have a submit animal observation link on our website. Uh, we'll take hard copies. Uh, we've developed survey one, two, three forms. However, we really are pointing people towards uh, iNaturalist. And I'd like to tell you, tell you more about that. Next slide. Um, the iNaturalist uh, community uh, basically has uh, this growing, really powerful um, pile of data. You can see the number of records there on the right side of this slide with 160 million observations globally, 291,000 in Montana, uh, 431,000 species uh, that are being reported in iNaturalist. And uh, over there on the far right, upper 2.8 million observers. Uh, you can see some trends in the data and the data coverage on these other images. Basically, we would we really, as a NatureServe network, really need to be taking uh, advantage of that data. And um, the other thing I want to say about the iNaturalist community is there's a great role for all of you to play in terms of identifying observations if you have that expertise. Um, but even if you don't have that expertise, it is a great way to understand all of the species around you. Uh, it's just a, a fabulous tool on that front. So you should use it for that reason alone. Um, next slide, please. This is a little bit of a complex slide that I'm gonna walk you through. On the left side, it shows you how our program, the Montana program works in the iNaturalist application. Um, we have established projects in there where we can get data reported to those projects, uh, always get precise data from those, from those projects. Uh, we've worked with all of our federal and state partners to identify what taxa should be either obscured or opened up on the spatial front um, within iNaturalist. We subscribe to different taxa, so we'll get an email every morning that basically says, hey, here's these uh, 40 uh, noxious weed records for you to review, uh, or in my case, amphibians, reptiles, and noxious weeds. I do that every morning, and it's, it's like eating ice cream when you first get to work. It's pretty awesome, actually. Um, and then we will communicate with individual people um, on specific records. Then at the very top center of this slide, we are downloading uh, monthly all of the iNaturalist data from Montana that goes into our server and we divide it up into a working table where we have all of the individual records. We have an, a table of taxa that basically tells us, can this taxa be identified with a photograph or a sound file? There's things like our chipmunks in Montana that you you can't identify them, and so it's it's not a not a, even if someone has identified them in iNaturalist, those identifications can't be trusted. Um, we also have a table of experts, and so we have over a hundred people uh, that have volunteered to be experts for uh, reviewing Montana data, and um, we can trust their IDs, and and if they've identified to a species, we'll bring that data straight into our database without any other looking at it. So. We've moved our workload out to the community, which is amazing. At the same time, uh, following that central box over to the right, we have audit reports that run off of that data. So if iNaturalist data shows as a, a, a there's a new species of concern record uh, in an area, we'll get an audit report that says, hey, there's this new record, and then we can go into iNaturalist and review it as an expert. We'll get an emailed audit as to whether there's a new species reported in Montana that's not in our databases. Any uh, species that is reported outside of the range polygon that we've delineated for species, uh, records that are greater than 10 kilometers from previous records, um, records that are outside our predicted habitat suitability model range, which is super interesting from the standpoint of um, maybe the, our models are wrong and we need to include this new data. Um, and then if anything has changed with that record, um, I'm not going to go through the bottom right of this, uh, but just suffice it to say, we have this automated process to append records. In the upper right, you can see this is since last October. We now have 23,124 animal observations that we've automatically brought into our observation database and 30,142 botanical records that we've automatically brought into our database, um, requiring very little staff time on our, on our part. Next slide, please. Um, so we now encourage iNaturalist uh, for data submissions above other methods. Uh, and basically because 
Uh, it's kind of addictive for the user. So we know that if we point them towards iNaturalist, they're not going to submit just one record, but they'll probably get into it and they'll submit other records. It also fosters appreciation for what species are around you. Um, and so that's just a wonderful accomplishment there. Um, the iNaturalist community assists us with record ID. Like I said, we've got those hundred uh, plus experts that we don't have to look at the data um, in detail. We can just bring it right into our database and make it available to our partners. Those photo and sound files that document those records are bundled with that uh, tabular data. Um, and then we can subscribe, like I said, to taxa uh, or locations. Um, and the records are very easy to review in iNaturalist. So the bottom image on the right here shows you, this is an email that I got. I just copied this right out of an email, one of my morning emails, basically with links to iNaturalist records that I've subscribed to these species. And I, you know, I think it would be something that you guys might enjoy um, as uh, natural history interest folks. We've gone so far that uh, this upper picture is a picture from our field guide. We used to have a button that would say submit Montana observations that would come to our table. We then added this iNaturalist button and now we've actually removed the submit animal observations option to go to our, our uh, locally developed process because it was taking us probably 15 to maybe 30 minutes per record to deal with those uh, records. With the iNaturalist records, I'm literally in that bottom image clicking on that link. I check the date, I check the location, I identify the species, 15 seconds. So I've gone from 15 minutes to 15 seconds to review a record and then that data is gonna automatically come into our database. Mm -hmm. So it's an amazing uh, increase in efficiency. Next right. slide. So the use cases for this data um, are just this massive increase in detection possibilities. Uh, there's a few examples in the in the uh, image to the right there, but newly arrived invasive species in the upper left of the composite image there is Palmer amaranth, which uh, came from RI Naturalist uh, workflows as the first record for this invasive species in the state. Could have cost Montana millions of dollars if it had gotten into our grain crops. Um, increase rarely det detected species like the central image here of this greater shorthorn lizard, which we just had a fabulous year this year with uh, iNaturalist records bringing um, greater shorthorn lizard data in. Um, improving understanding of range extents, the bottom image here shows um, a uh, uh, jumping mouse range extension. Uh, the red line was the old range polygon that we had. And then this uh, dot um, south of uh, Livingston shows you a new record that came in on iNaturalist that allowed us to increase the range and we were then remodeled the species and you can see that observation is falling in what we would say is a landscape that's moderately suitable uh, for this species. Um, so conservation really improved the conservation for this, this species. Um, improves our, our predicted habitat suitability models, our element occurrences. Uh, we think we're gonna be doing some occupancy analysis off of this. And then of course, all of that feeds into the understanding of the conservation status of the species. Next slide. Uh, okay. There you go. So if you're amenable, we need you, one, to be expert record identifiers. And two, if you don't wanna be a re expert record identifier, just try it out. I think you'll really enjoy it. You can learn a lot about the, the species that are around you. You could set up a um, subscription to say, show me all the iNaturalist records that come up within 10 miles. And you can use that to figure out when certain flowers are coming into bloom and you can go identify them and, and, and go out and enjoy them yourself, for instance. Um, the second thing here is we need to find funders to um, make the workflow that we've made in Montana and, and make that uh, a practical thing to be used across the US. There's a note, iNaturalist node in the US and then there's an iNaturalist node in Canada. And so we wanna make a common ingestion tool. We're actually in the process of doing this already, a common ingestion tool that would have a common expert table so that we wouldn't have to have an individual expert table from Montana and Nebraska, North Dakota and whatnot. We could take advantage of this common pool of experts download all of that data 
And then we need to make tools to allow that expert reviewed data, that high quality data to be downloaded either to NatureServe or downloaded to individual uh, programs in the NatureServe network um, with the filters that they need to, to get what they need. Um, you know, maybe they're just using it for modeling or maybe they're using it for element occurrence development or, uh, or maybe they're not interested in all taxa, but they're only interested in, in some. Um, but we need some we need some funding to help develop that. So thank you. That's great. Thanks. I mean, I think this is a really good example of how alumni can be pulled in and offer some advice and their expertise. And uh, it's just is there anything else folks should know about, you know, contacting individual programs in their jurisdictions? Because not every state is is kind of at this point yet. No, just to say that we are under the process of developing sort of a common data ingestion tool that other uh, programs could use. Um, but then once we have that sort of common pool of expert data, we're going to need to develop tools that can be used for download to those those individual programs. And so it uh, looks like we have an opportunity maybe to take that some of those first steps with uh, Canadian CWCs um, and our CDC, sorry, and then... Um, and then, uh, you know, we're looking for what what region in the U.S. makes the most sense to, you know, kind of tackle as the first sort of custom downloads from that common ingestion table. Oh. But in the meantime, folks it, who are interested can just start using yeah, iNatural. I, in the meantime, nobody could go wrong by starting to work more in iNaturalist because then that data is there and uh, it's just being um, curated and developed and Again, the more we can get the word out there, the more people who will use it, the more detectors we have running around on the landscape. Um, but again, if you've got the identification skills, that's that much more important because you could be um, making the data uh, of much higher quality in the meantime. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, no, that could get you could get started on that tomorrow. Yeah, and we have a we have a pretty long history with iNaturalist. It's not a new thing. I mean, in fact, yep. when I was still there, I could remember we actually had some contracts with iNaturalist where they were setting up local iNaturalist nodes in Texas and then in Manitoba as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were really well received in those lo locations. And we've we've known the folks um, for Scott Laurie and his his staff for a long time. Yep. Right. All right. And I would also add, I mean, there's some really in-depth discussion about this in, a, in the presentation that was done a couple of months ago, right? I mean, the one that you did talks also about a program in Maryland that's uh, exploring this as well. Um, so I really encourage folks to go and look at some of these previous webinars. They're very easy to access through, through YouTube, um, and it's worth the time just listening to them. Yeah, we've got about uh, eight minutes left, so we should probably ask if uh, anyone in attendance has any questions or comments. Yep. Do we want to switch it over so we can see everybody? Yeah, I'll try to do that if you want to stop sharing your... Yeah, let's see. Well, hold on a second. I... Okay. should no longer be the presentation. How are we doing? We can see you. But yeah, and I have it, the attendee view is on gallery right now. Hmm. So I should be working, but it doesn't look like it is, I agree. Oh, they're getting the same option of not being able to turn on their video. I'll tell you what, folks, since we're having a little bit of a technical issue here as Bryce continues to try to open up the gallery view, why don't we just use the chat um, for the next few minutes? And I'm sorry for the disappointment of not seeing each other's faces, but we may still get there. So um, if you do have any comments or questions or Rob, if I think you had a question or two you wanted to ask folks, um, let's let's go ahead with it in the chat. Yeah, I mean, well, again, this is kind of a general thing. I think since we have a limited amount of time left, I'd like to combine everything and just say, you know, we're 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 interested in hearing what folks have been doing, particularly as it relates to helping, you know, in the conservation community, particularly supporting their member programs or NatureServe. And 
also want to hear what you think we could do as alumni um, and what what you feel an alumni group for this organization really should be about. I mean, we'd like to get your input on that because it, up to this point, it's been it, it's been kind of very vague in general. Um, you know, the main presence has been a Facebook page, as far as I could tell, and it seems like there's more we could be doing. I'll go ahead and answer Dave Anderson's uh, question there. Um, yeah, Dave, we, so we have uh, this last year, our botanist, Andrea Pip, has last couple of years has developed this um, citizen science botany program where they're going to they go out and revisit previously known element occurrences of our species of concern plants. And while they're doing that, we encourage them to also take the iNaturalist app with them to document other species along the way. Uh, and we've done several trainings uh, now for our other agency partners for them to use iNaturalist to um, report data. Again, we're 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 kind of almost at the point where, boy, again, it, it builds such an addiction with the user that we'd almost uh, some of some of the things that we used to do with Survey One Two Three, we're contemplating like just do it with iNaturalist because then they'll they'll get even more addicted. So. Any more chats, uh, questions? Can we hear from anybody? Yeah, definitely Dave, definitely Dave. I, I will just also r remind folks too that there is a survey going out, you know, as we, we have a limited amount of time to just have this conversation. We're not sitting around a table, we can all just talk. So think about it, you know, think about, you know, what you've been doing that might be of interest to other folks that they may want to consider doing themselves. Think about what you would like to see an alumni group do. And, and you can add those comments and uh, we can look at some things to do in the future. I mean, uh, Rick, you had some thoughts about having future webinars where we would, we would involve uh, directors from heritage programs to talk about their activities too. Yeah, I think that uh, if if people are interested in finding out what's going on in the network as well as at NatureServe, I mean, having this Bryce has done today, uh, talking about uh, innovative things their programs are doing and how alumni could get involved would be just would be great. Um, we would be more than happy to. Uh, there's a couple programs who are use iNaturalist a lot. We'd be more than happy to do a training for alumni on how to most efficiently use iNaturalist because. There's a lot there, um, and you would eventually, if you used it a bunch, you would you would figure it all out. But there's a lot there that we could, you know, kind of guide new users into how to use iNaturalist most efficiently. Yeah. If there are any final questions or comments, um, please do throw them into the chat, and also. Um, as Rob mentioned, we will be sending out the recording, not only to the group that participated today, but to nearly um, 400 total alumni. So we are reaching out to quite a few folks and we are hearing back from folks. Uh, they did, weren't all able to join us today, but we are getting some correspondence going back and forth. So things are beginning to pick up in our connectivity with all of you. And we appreciate those of you that came today. Along with that recording, um, there will be the survey that Rob mentioned, um, and it would be great if you could take a few minutes, it's just about you know, six questions, um, just so we can get a pulse kind of of where you are, what you're doing now, um, if you're still um, affiliating or, or helping, volunteering, corresponding with the heritage programs um, and so on and so forth. It just gives us a good idea of kind of what directions maybe we could move in together. And uh, last, what you'll receive in the email that'll go out tomorrow is the resource document that Rob mentioned earlier in the presentation. And as he said, it's not comprehensive, um, but it is a start to sort of catch up, if you will, uh, for those of you who would wish to, on what's been going on the last uh, few, ye few years, especially the last uh, two years um, at NatureServe in a series of webinars that we've been hosting similar to this one, um, on different topics by our experts. So I hope you'll take a look at all those things at your leisure over this weekend coming up. And I wanna again, thank um, Bryce and Sabra and Rick and Rob for really putting a lot of time and effort to think this through. 
Um, and thank you, Bruce, for your message. I see that here that your um your alumni Facebook page. Um, we yes, we do we do have for those of you who use Facebook, we do have a Nature Serve alumni Facebook page where that you can join um, at, at will and uh, can communicate with folks who are participating on that page already. You can also find um, that page in our social media. Um, this week, we posted um, some information there for how to join. And I can send that out as well if folks are interested. So thanks for bringing that up, Bruce. That's a great idea. Yeah. I will say I, I have been faceless forever. I just joined Facebook for the first time to become part of the Nature Serve alumni Facebook page. So. Well, again, many thanks, and um, we'll see you soon. Thanks, all. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.